welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, as we know, we're a community of people who are uh, deeply curious about the world. We're uh, deeply caring about the uh, environment around us. We're deeply concerned to stay current with uh, what's happening. Um, and so you probably guessed we're here today to talk about the fascinating subject, an important subject of journalism. My name is Bonnie Louie, and I have the good fortune of being a new teacher at CIS. And I'm teaching year seven and year nine. I'm Miriam Lynch. I'm a year 12 student, and I'm the editor-in-chief of South Park. I'm Stephen Irving. I'm a parent uh, at CIS. Uh, I'm also the editor of a magazine called Week in China. Hi, I'm Conrad Chang. I'm in year 12 and the head of news of Xiaofa. When do you remember first becoming interested in the news? I think the first news item that really registered for me when I was a kid was the, uh, the Falklands War, when Britain went to war with Argentina over the Falklands, which was in the early 1980s. It was a first experience of actually watching television and seeing people talking about death and war. And it, it felt like quite a big deal at the time. It felt like, well, you know, what's going to happen here? What's the, it felt like a lot of uncertainty. So I, I guess that was a, the thing that really took over the headlines in Britain when I was growing up at that time. The first story that I can really remember was um, watching the reporting on the Obama election as well um, at a family friend's house and I was really young and I so I don't remember a lot but I can still remember kind of the energy and the excitement around him winning the election and I can still remember where I was and I think that was quite an important moment in realizing how the news can really um, can really affect people. I would watch the news with my parents either like before or after dinner and we'd kind of talk about it. So this started from a very young age and I think that kind of fostered my interest in news. Local events as well. Um, there were uh, legislative council elections in Hong Kong before. I kind of followed that pretty closely. Uh, there was an Occupy Central movement which was like on TV every single second of the day. I kind of followed that closely as well. Growing up in Montreal, Quebec, there was a lot of Quebec politics that affected my everyday life. So in the early 80s, my dad, he actually bought a TV to put into the kitchen so he could follow the Meech Lake Accords, uh, so he could observe what the politicians were saying directly without the media spin. That resulted in um, the Quebec referendum in 95, which the question was, would, it was about Quebec sovereignty and whether Quebec would stay a part of Canada. So of course that had a huge impression of, on me. How about writing or, or otherwise reporting about the news? What was your first subject? The first article I wrote was actually a piece of satire I wrote in Hangzhou. There was a project in Hangzhou and you kind of had the freedom to choose whatever to write about, about kind of like start a project. So I, so uh, my friend and I chose to start kind of satire blog thing. So my first article was about Trump and Modi's bromance. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but right now, um, uh, I have a few other friends who write with me and I think um, that that was a really good starting point and really good like learning experience for me. The first thing that I wrote um, really that I knew was going to be published was I was writing for um, a blog um, for an NGO in Hong Kong um, and I I was given the task of interviewing um, a uh, macro photographer who was in high school and um, it was really interesting because it was the first time that I was given the like freedom to kind of shape the interview and ask the questions I wanted to ask and um, the person that I was interviewing was quite close to my age and it was really um, really interesting to see what he was doing. I was working as a kind of intern, like an unpaid intern, at this newspaper on the sort of the, the back page sports desk. And, and the, the Alex Ferguson, Sir Alex Ferguson, was then the manager of Manchester United, obviously extremely successful. But he hated this particular newspaper that I was working for. And he actually refused to speak to this newspaper because 
It had written some article many years before that he, he really hated. So it happened that my grandfather, um, who is from Glasgow, knew Alex Ferguson from decades and decades ago. So anyway, my grandfather decided to do me a favor and call up Alec Ferguson and ask him to speak to me. Wow. Even though I was writing for this newspaper that Alex Ferguson hated. <laughs> and so um, Ferguson did speak to me. I called him up on the phone. He spoke to me for about 10 minutes talking about David Beckham and all the, the young players of that generation. And that ended up being the first article I got published in a, in a national newspaper. Uh, the editor of our high school newspaper, he asked me to write an article, but it, and that's credit to, to what you do. And it was really hard to find a topic that would interest my classmates. Me and my roommate, we ended up writing about campus life, uh, but it didn't actually make it into the newspaper. <laughs> Do you agree the news often is reporting on the darker sides of the human experience? A journalist in the UK um, called Martin Bell, I think, he worked for the BBC, and he was complaining about the fact that there was so much bad news being aired on television and in newspapers in terms of print, and that it was not good for society in his view, that everyone was just reading bad news all the time. when. Clearly, most people's experience in everyday life is everything isn't bad. He was saying that's not a really fair picture and we should try and create more balance in the news so there are more happier, positive, uplifting stories to counterbalance the overwhelming number of negative stories. And this was a really good idea. Um, unfortunately, they didn't really get anywhere um, because he was swimming against the, the tide because ultimately bad news sells. There's a study out of McGill University and it looks into the negativity bias. And so that study found that uh, because of a survival instinct, the participants, they would automatically click to, they were given another context for why they were looking at news stories and selecting news stories. And they found that because of a survival instinct, people were automatically drawn to negative news. What are some positive news elements you, you think we should pay attention to these days that aren't getting proper attention in your eyes? It's focusing on individuals. It's a great way to start individuals and their communities and sometimes in order to be newsworthy, you know, it doesn't have to be like a multi-million dollar effort, right? You know, it can be, let's say, one parent, us, you know, um, holding the kind of stop sign every morning, right, for, for for, for kids in that district um, when, when they're reading the school bus, for example. Like, that's something that, that's pretty newsworthy for me, right? Um, so, you know, a, a lot of times, focusing, like starting with individuals and how they're kind of using their um, own kind of limited powers, their own, 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 own limited efforts to kind of help their community and kind of the impact they're creating. And that's pretty inspiring for people reading the paper as well. Yeah. I think we need more positive news in is um, climate change, just because I think there is a lot of negative news and not to say that that shouldn't be reported. I think um, like those kinds of stories, it's important that um, we are worried about climate change because that's how we'll get action. But I think it's also important, um, especially in climate change, it's important to feel like people are doing like that like also focusing on individuals that we as individuals can do things and that we're also, we are surrounded by other people who also want to maybe do the same things as us and fight climate change as well. Because I think it is really, for to fight climate change, you need a spirit of togetherness. And I think that that can only come if there are more positive stories around climate change. With climate change, it's so easy just to read negativity all the time. But if, if you do have more inspirational stories and even on the technology side of explaining why some piece of technology has just been invented somewhere and how it's making a bit of a difference. Uh, at least it gives you hope that there actually is positive things you can do and you don't have to get out of bed every morning and think, oh, the world's a worse place today. Actually, we can actually be doing positive things as well. What does it mean to be objective? And, I mean, is it even possible to be objective? There, there, is, there is no such thing yeah. as pure objectivity. Um, Oftentimes, there's got to be a story, there's got to be an angle, so you always give weight to one thing more than another. Someone doesn't give you as much information, so there's more weight on one side of a story than another side of a story. What you say is, 
is just as important as what is left out half the time as well. Mm. So the power of omission, which most of the readers don't necessarily see, but if you're a very trained eye because you're a writer yourself, a journalist, you can often see where a story becomes skewed just because of the use of one word or what's left out. Um, so, yeah, you, over time you realise that everything pretty much does have some form of bias, whether it's extreme bias or very small bias and sometimes unintentional bias, but it's always there because human beings are not robots. Our year seven class, we're learning about religion, and so we're talking about um, nonfiction reading. One thing um, Tiffany Hay has um, shared, she made a really big point that this nonfiction reading is not fact, uh, true, true reading. It's fact. It's not factual reading, but it's the author's interpretation of what is factual information. And yeah, I think that's a really important point to drive home with all students. For me, uh, knowing that a lot of my news comes from you know seeing what my friends have posted on Facebook, it was real eye opener of this echo chamber that I was in in the way that I was consuming news. And so I think it's really important for students to always um, be very active in seeking out opinions that would differ from yours. Well, so what about young people? Going back to what you were saying earlier on, we imagine our students in primary school. Uh, what advice would you give them? As students, it's just really important to understand um, kind of, especially when we're looking at social media, why we are getting this news and understand that it is um, be able to understand that it is like algorithms that are sending it back to us and it is just our own our own perspectives just being reinforced and I think it's really important to understand um, yeah what biases that we are seeing in ourselves and just be able to identify those as we read news. I would encourage students young and old to be curious about all the time about what the counter argument is and like I was saying before try and get out of your echo chamber and as the IB philosophy says, it says, uh, recognize that people with other opinions can also be right. It is that that sort of research mm. training that I think becomes very important in terms of creating that sort of independent critical thinking, which I think is is vital to be a, a citizen who who consumes news media in a, in a logical way. You've got to get away from just being addicted to social media and just taking your social media feed. Mm -hmm. Start seeking out um, other information sources. Try and use your critical faculties to figure out if they're reliable or not. Um, do they seem well researched? You know, has a lot of work gone into the research, a lot of time. Um, like for example, you know, I think in terms of uh, historically, you would always say that New Yorker articles are extremely well researched. Typically the writers worked on them for four or five months. Um, and they could, obviously they're quite long articles as well. But that sort of thing, the more time and energy that goes into an article, the more you kind of know, I know I said before beforehand that there's no such thing as objectivity, but you know that someone at least is striving towards it. And it's a, it's a bit like chasing a rainbow, but at least someone's actually making the effort as much as possible to try and give all sides of the story. Xiaowa is about to reach a major milestone in its history at CIS, which is the publication of its 25th edition. Tell us a little bit more about what you have in store for us and how you went about choosing um, the, the main theme. So our theme for this issue is um, culture crash, which is what we're really trying to explore is just the ways in which um, like globally we different cultures interact and we're trying to kind of, our previous issue, the 24th issue was, the theme was Abyss of the Mind, which was a lot more about the self um, and individuals um, and in this issue, we're trying to kind of bring people back together and, you know, explore how we understand our own culture. And especially in Hong Kong, where we have a lot of different cultures, we're trying to kind of focus in on communities um, and the importance of communities. This year with, with Xiaohua, we're kind of trying to, um, to report on more campus news and also more local news because a lot of times we're Kind of um, a little bit distance from from the greater Hong Kong community. We're we're a very privileged community, right? So I think using journalism to kind of bridge this gap and, and learn more about the community around us is 
something yeah. that we're trying to do. Thank you very much for this fascinating discussion. It's been very helpful to us to understand better uh, the world in which we're living and the way in which news can shape our understanding and our interaction with that world. We hope that you've enjoyed this conversation and we look forward to the next one. Above all, we look forward to the 25th edition of Xiaowa that we should be able to read in January.